right, so Sandy Gennaro, thank you very much for joining the KISS FAQ podcast. Thank you so much, Julian. I appreciate the opportunity. So, obviously, we're a KISS podcast, so you know where I'm going. Uh, you, I do. It, it, you, you, you can take several different routes to that. But I, I, I'm going to go straight there. Okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Blackjack. Right. Obviously, that is the first real professional recordings that Bruce Kulick did. Correct. Um, I, I want to ask you about the formation of that band. How did Blackjack come about, and how did you get roped into that? I got roped into Blackjack. Uh, I was living out in L.A. at the time, and I, uh, on a recommendation of, uh, well, actually, I wrote a resume, and I sent the resume to managers of 50 bands that I really liked. I haven't done any anything of note. I was trying to get my first big break, and one of those resumes went to Peter Grant, uh, manager of Led Zeppelin. Right. And uh, my resume, all of their mail got forwarded through the attorney's office, Led Zeppelin's attorney's office, Steve Weiss. Right. And he opened my resume. Instead of forwarding it to England, he opened my resume. And right at that time, he was putting a band together around Michael Bolton, okay. or then known as Michael Bloating. So he asked me to go to come to New York and, uh, and and audition, and I flew to New York and got the gig. And Bruce, uh, Bruce was already involved with Michael. Uh, and then there was a different bass player there, the original audition, and then they flew Jimmy Haslip in. Right. And we rehearsed for a couple of days. Uh, we auditioned for a bunch of labels, and Polydor, Steve Weiss engineered a record deal with Polydor Records. And basically that was, that was it. And then we, uh, based on Steve Weiss, Weiss's connections and his clout in the music business, we got Tom Dow to produce the record. And that's a pretty Christ. major producer to get for a debut album at the time. I mean, he, he was on. He didn't, he didn't, as a rule, didn't um, produce new bands, but as a favor to Steve Weiss, uh, he did. And we were in, we found ourselves in Criteria Studios in Miami being, being produced by a Hall of Fame producer. That was one of my highlights of my 55-year career, that record, that first record. You know, your first love is that you always right. remember your first love. Right. You know? But how did the band work? I mean, you're obviously, you're, you're, you're musicians who didn't come together kind of naturally and do a scene first. You, you were a construction. How did that affect the uh, band from it, a starting point? We, we, we all had the chemistry as if it was a band that rehearsed in a garage. We, we all got along really, really well, and uh, there was no real difference. When I was in Blackjack, there was, it felt like a, 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 an organic band because we all got along as friends off stage and off, you know, out of the studio. We used to go hang out socially, and so there was no real difference uh, being put together or being organically grown, if you will, you know what I mean? Right. Did you guys play together live before you entered the studio, or were you put together and immediately go into the studio? And I know, I'm asking you to go back 45 years, and I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday, so... Uh, if my memory is uh, correct, I think we went straight, we rehearsed uh, and went straight into the studio. After we got the record deal, we auditioned for Tom Dowd and he wanted to produce us again as a favor to, he loved the band, right. but as a favor to Steve and then we were in Criteria and then after the album was, was out, uh, then we went on tour. We we uh, opened for Peter Frampton for, right. for a couple of uh, couple of weeks. Actually, it was the Peter Frampton tour right after the Frampton Comes Alive tour. Right. He supported an album called uh, I'm in You. Yep. And uh, yeah, so that was that was great. We we did limited amount of touring, and then we went back into the studio. We did some club gigs around New York, my father's place in in uh, Long Island, but, and then we went back into the studio to do the second record. Right now, by that time, you you've been together, you played some shows live, so a band gets more locked in and tighter. Correct. I, I, I want to ask you as a drummer, who do you lock in with more? Are you a, do you lock in with bass or are you looking to guitar? Well, I don't. I. <laughs> It's not from an ego standpoint, but the structure of a band, the rhythm section, it comes from the drummer. Yep. It's the it bass foundation. Player, it's the bass player's job to lock in with me. It's not my job to lock in with the bass player. I'm the source of the rhythm. Yep. And and he is the the bass player is the intermediate instrument between the drums and the melodic instrument. Okay, great. That's a great differentiation Absolutely. that you're only going to get when you ask a drummer. Because well, if you ask a different person, they might not necessarily uh, give that answer. Well, that's the way music is constructed. The right. drummer, the drummer, the rhythm comes from the drummer. 
and if, if and it's the drummer's job to bring the band in sync with him right. in order to produce a nice foundation for the singer to sing upon. Uh, if you have a bass player that says the bass player is the most important person in the band, I guarantee you he's got a five-string bass. Right. And he plays all kinds of chops, whatever. It's the bass player's job to lock in with that kick drum of the drummer. That's That's... That's something I've known for 55 years. So for the second album, Worlds Apart, um, you had Eddie Alford producing. Correct. Um, how did that differ for you than working with Tom Dowd? Because he's a, di a completely different character. Uh, it was very, very different. <laughs> it was very different. Not only is Eddie Alford a very a different person than Tom Dowd, but we did it in Woodstock in the winter time, where Crite the Tom Dowd album Criteria was in Miami. That's a different scene. And, and now it, we're in, I think it was in Levon Helm's studio, where it was really cold in there. And Eddie Offord wasn't, and I don't want to speak bad about anybody, it was a great experience, and the, the result was the World's Apart record, which I really like, and some of the tracks are even, are really, really good. But he, he wasn't Tom Dowd, let's put it that way. And sometimes he was an absentee producer. And a lot of times in that session, if my memory serves me correctly, it was Bruce and Michael basically putting the producer hat on. And that, right. You know what I mean? So Eddie Offer was, was cool, but I have more experience with Bruce and, and Michael both in being behind the board when producing yeah. than Eddie. Right. I don't know what, what Bruce has to say about Eddie, but that's basically my take. I've never really talked to Bruce about the album, uh, but when I first heard it, Airwaves, great song, uh, Welcome to the World, I think it's hilariously yeah. great. Um, my World is Empty Without You is a that, great that's, cover. That's a, a really, really powerful song, and the one that jumps out to me, and I didn't know who Michael Bolton was at that point when I first, maybe it's The Power of Love. Right. And then you hear where Michael went later. Right. Did, did you guys get the inkling that Michael struggled with his musical identity? He's a great rock singer, but wow, does he do that power R&B stuff the really, power really well. Yeah, he, he does it. I mean, he's got a great voice, and uh, uh, I love Michael, and it was a great experience working with such such a, a you know, a, a, a talent as him and Bruce. I was really, really lucky being in a band, my first recording band, my first album deal with such talented musicians. And uh, I always wondered why he, F. Michael, after that first record, he kind of went into the R&B thing, but he always kind of, I don't think he likes to talk about the blackjack, the rock and roll genre. No, 83, he had Bob Kulick come in right. when he did his first solo album, went out on the road, kind of as blackjack, Bruce went with him, right? and he did hard rock. I mean, it was harder rock than what he'd been doing with Blackjack, which had a lot of the R&B elements right. um, still in there. So it, it, that's what makes me think he didn't quite know where he wanted to be. Maybe not. I, I, I wasn't in his mind, so I don't really, I yeah. don't really know. I don't really know what what his vibe was. But uh, when I was on stage with him or in the studio, it was just awesome. It was very inspirational. So what went wrong with Blackjack? Why didn't it succeed, and how did it end? Uh, how did it end? Well, it kind of just dissipated after that second record. We, I don't think we did any touring in support of that record. Um, uh, you know, the story I get from some some record people, A and R people at Polygram, when I years and years later I say, you know what? Whatever happened with that? Why didn't it ever happen? Because it was really hyped. It was hyped really, really big. It was the priority uh, release in 1979, and the feedback that I get from A and R people was that. Well, maybe it was a little bit too overhyped mm. because we had independent, aside from Polydor promotion people, we had independent promotion people going to radio saying that, hey, listen, this is the best thing since white bread. You got to play it, you know, signed by the people that signed Foreigner and this, you know, whatever. So they put it on and it was good, but it wasn't, it didn't live up to the hype. That's the vibe that I get. Right. But, we had a lot of promotion. We had everything a new band would ever want. You as had far music as, video. We had music video in 1979 uh, on the roof of Polygram on 7th Avenue. Full stage press With a helicopter. Yep. Helicopter doing the opening and the outro. We had, uh, we, you know, we did videos before MTV. Uh, yeah, it, it was, it was uh, full color, four page ads on the back cover of Billboard. Yep. 
We had everything a new band would want, so that speaks to my the opinion that I've been given by A and R people that it was maybe it was just too much putting up, uh, you know, the hype, and it didn't really live up to the hype. So, but individually, you've all done very well. Bruce obviously went on to play with a whole bunch of artists, and you know, even if we leave out Kiss, right. he's had an incredible career. Absolutely, um, and still going strong. Jimmy. Session work again with Kiss, Black, uh, Yellow Jackets. Yep. Uh, you just, yep. you know, incredible. But you also have had an incredible career yep. afterwards. Well, what are your highlights for you, looking back at your career, the most important elements that you think people should check out from your catalog well, of work? Well, from my catalog of work, listen, I, I, people ask me all the time, what was my favorite gig? And listen, I, I from Blackjack, I went to the Pat Travers Band, which was just awesome. I replaced Tommy Aldrich in that band, and that was just awesome. I went back with Pat. That was in 81. I went back with Pat in, in uh, um, 2015 and played with him for about you know three or four years. 2010 and played with him about three or four years. Uh, Cindy Lauper, I did her for very first tour. Oh, I did um, uh, Joan Jett's tour uh, of the Far East in 1979-90. Uh, played on her uh, the hit list. That's okay. wild because I was at that show in Singapore. Why well, yeah, well, you? Yep. And ironically, I'm going to be speaking uh, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, which is the first time I was there was with Joan, and now right. I'm being asked to come back and speak through my public speaking. That's fantastic because that was one of the first big major metal or hard rock shows in Singapore because they still had the ban on long hairs right up until before that. Ah, okay. So you couldn't get in the country, but Joan. Brought her band, and yeah. we all went crazy. It was a fantastic thing. So well, great that's awesome that you, you were there in Singapore. Yeah, that was awesome. That's wild. Yeah, we, we landed. It was like the Beatles landing. There was like crowds at the airport. We did a press conference and all of that. It was awesome. And it, my, but my most memorable tour, if I may add, was a band called Kraft. In 1986, I did their record. Um, C-R-A-A-F-T, based in Germany. I did their record, and then they asked me to do the tour in support of that record in the summer of 86, and we opened for Queen oh for three God. and a half months in the summer, touring Europe, big open-air concerts, 110,000 people, soccer stadiums, whatever. It was it was just awesome getting to know those guys and touring with them and hanging with them and partying with them. It was just, it was just an awesome experience. You never heard of the band, Kraft, but that was one of my most memorable tours I've ever done in my whole life. And so with a 55-year-old career, you know, who are your influences? Ringo Starr. Ringo. What is it about Ringo? Ringo is the consummate service drummer. He serves the song. He doesn't want to shine the spotlight on him. He serves the song. And, you know, I'm sure in, in, uh, in sessions at Abbey Road, I'm sure McCartney being a, himself a drummer and being him the writer of a lot of the songs dictated a lot of parts uh, to Ringo. I'm sure George Martin being the excellent producer dictated some parts to Ringo, but he always played them with a smile. Yep. In other words, yeah, you, you're the songwriter. You want me to play that? Okay. He wasn't like, hey, I'm the drummer you know whatever yep. you listen to some of those songs and still today I, I'm amazed at some of the the innovative beats that he played in some of those songs like I Feel Fine and, and Day Tripper and all of that it's just uh, he's, he's my major influence and will continue to be until I'm pushing up days. did you watch that Get Back documentary sure and did. just watching Ringo and how he approached those sessions isn't that a thing of beauty and you know what you know what the thing of beauty uh is the fact that Ringo, you, when you see in, in that movie, when you see like George Martin and some people hovering around trying to discuss, let's say for example, let's, where we're gonna do our final concert. Should we do it on the roof? Should we do it here? Ringo was always there, but he never opened his mouth. Yep. He was always there in, impeccably dressed and he was just listening in on the conversation. You know, and I'm sure when asked of his opinion, he would give it. Mm -hmm. But he never was, ah, uh, you yeah. know, he, he was just awesome, man, as a person. And I had the had pleasure of meeting him in a shoe store in L.A. in 1976. But, um, but yeah, Ringo was my guy. 
What about Charlie Watts? I love Charlie Watts. Because he's, he's from a similar school. He's a, from a similar school of playing. And Charlie Watts, too, is a jazz drummer. He's an mm-hmm. accomplished jazz drummer, but he plays exactly what the song needs. You yep. need, you want boom, bap, boom, honky-tonk woman? I'll give you honky-tonk woman. Yep. You know? And um, so he's a, he's a consummate service drummer as well. Awesome. Well, Sandy Gennaro, where can people find you, and what do you have currently going on professionally? Well, currently going on professionally, I have a book called Beat the Odds in Business in Life. I'm also doing a lot of um, uh, uh, motivational speaking to corporate, to conferences all over the world. I'm going, as I said, I'm going back going to, to Kuala Lumpur. Yep. Um, so yeah, you can get my book on, on Amazon. It's called uh, Beat the Odds in Business and in Life. Or you can go to my website, sandygenero.com, and you can get a um, you can contact me, email me, sandy at sandygenero.com. I have an audio book, a digital book. So that's basically, and I play in a band here in Nashville called Rock United. And we do covers of 70s and 80s awesome. material and the same songs I played in the 70s and 80s. That's fantastic. But yeah, we play around uh, around Nashville. So yeah, come and say hi and uh, email me. Let me know what you think of the podcast. And uh, I would appreciate that very much. Awesome. Well, Sandy, thanks a lot for taking the time to join us You're today. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time.